النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه أمهاتهم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولهم بعد uh, So today inshallah ta'ala we will be doing uh, our mother Hafsa binti Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala an and uh, she is obviously in the tartib that we are doing and in the tartib or the order of the marriage she is the fourth uh, wife of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after now all of you should memorize one by one but I hope inshallah by the time we end these series that all of you have memorized the names of our mothers so Khadija Radiallahu Anha and then number two Sauda Binti Sauda Binti Sauda Binti Binti Abiyah, mashallah, mashallah. Shalter, mashallah. Allah ta'ala alik. Sauda binti Zam'a. And then number three is Aisha binti Abi Bakr al Siddiq. Now we have number four, Hafsa binti Umar ibn al Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hafsa, her mother, was Zaina binti Mad'oon. Uh, and Zainab is the brother of the very famous Sahabi Uthman ibn Mad'oon and Qudama ibn Mad'oon. This was a whole family. I've already mentioned Uthman ibn Mad'oon a number of times and he is a very prominent figure uh, of early seerah but he passes away in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu so we don't have, believe it or not, a long story about him even though he is very prominent in many stories. So he is the Khal, he is the uncle of uh, Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, we don't have... Uh, any information about her early childhood as is to be expected a girl being born in the Meccan era but we do know that she was born the year that the Kaaba was being rebuilt therefore this is five years before the prophethood therefore uh, she is essentially roughly the same age uh, as Fatima according to one report or five years younger than Fatima. I remember we mentioned Fatima was born either five years before the prophethood or the year of the prophethood. So she is essentially at the time of the hijrah, she will be 18 years old. So she is five years before the prophethood, add 13 to that. So at the time of the hijrah, she is 18 years old. She is also the eldest of Umar ibn Khattab's children. Umar had many children. We went over the riwayat when we mentioned the story of Umar. How many children he had we don't know exactly how many but he had a lot of children and uh, the eldest was Hafsa radiallahu anha and he took from her his kunya and his kunya was Abu Hafs Hafs is the masculine name and uh, it even though it is allowed to have the kunya of your eldest daughter but uh, it is also allowed to basically change the daughter's name to the son and so Umar's kunya was Abu Hafs because of Hafsa because Hafs, Hafs is the masculine of Hafsa. And uh, of course, Hafsa had many brothers and sisters. Her closest brother, uh, both in terms of age and in terms of uh, companionship and in terms of sharing the same mother and father, a full brother, was the famous Abdullah ibn Umar. And I gave his biography very early on when we did the biography of the Sahaba. So Abdullah ibn Umar is her full brother from the same mother, even, even though he was obviously younger than her. So she is the eldest of all of the siblings. So Hafsa radiallahu anha, she was married at some point in time to a Sahabi by the name of Khunais ibn Hudhafa. Khunais ibn Hudhafa. And this Khunais, we don't have any reports about him, except that he was one of the first batches of converts to Islam, even before the conversion of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an. Hence, it is an opinion that I have derived, and Allah knows best, if Khunais converted uh, with the first batch, he is mentioned in a long list of converts after Ibn Mas'ud. So this is very early on. If Khunais converted that early on, then the assumption is Hafsa also converted that early on. And hence the assumption is that Hafsa converted before her father, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an. Khunais and Hafsa, they both migrated to Habasha. They came back from Habasha and then they migrated to Medina. So she went to Medina, so she attained the two hijras. So she is a muhajira to Habasha and a muhajira to Medina and Khunais participated in the battle of Badr and so Khunais is of the highest level of Sahaba he is a Badri and he is a muhajir and he is a muhajir of Habasha he basically checks all of the boxes that you have to be in the elite of the Sahaba but there is no story at all about him because he passes away right after the battle of Badr and we don't have uh, he doesn't die from Badr 
it seems like he dies a natural cause or just as it was back then, the time span or the frame was usually uh, smaller and people died of natural causes or diseases. He simply just appears to have died uh, right after Badr, but not because of Badr. Why do I say this? Because everybody who was injured at Badr, there's a special list for them. Everybody who died as a Shaheed of Badr, there's a special list of them. Khunais' name does not come on that list. Therefore, from this we infer that he died a natural death, but he died after the battle of Badr and the two of them did not have any children. And so Hafsa remains childless for her entire life and Hafsa becomes a widow at the prime of her age. She is 20 or 21 years old and Hafsa is now a widow and she does not have a husband. Hafsa's, uh, the, the, the timing of the widow, like when she became a widow, it is roughly a, a few months after Uthman as well became a widower. And that is because Ruqayya passed away, as you know, you know, after the Battle of Badr. And so it seems that their two deaths were in a very similar time frame, whether a few days or a few weeks or a few months, we don't know. But it appears that basically in the same time frame, Ruqayya passes away and uh, uh, Khunais as well passes away. And so Umar radiallahu anh, logically concludes, the obvious conclusion is that, okay, Uthman is now single, and so he is the ideal candidate for my daughter. And so Uthman radi uh, sorry, Umar radiallahu anh, goes to Uthman, and he says to Uthman that, uh, as you know, my daughter is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Shabba, she's a young lady, and she has become a widow, and um, if you're interested in marrying her, then uh, I would be more than honored to do that. So Uthman radiallahu anh, said, let me think about this. And he came back in a few days, and he said that I have decided to not marry at this time, as a gentle no. I've decided to not marry at this time. Umar said, Uthman's rejection hurt me. He knows he's a single man. He knows he's wanting to get married. And the way that he's phrasing it, basically he's saying, I don't want to get married at this time. Of course he wants to get married, but he's just a polite way of saying no. And so Umar felt like, what is wrong with my family or my daughter? Why doesn't he want my daughter Hafsa? Then he decided to go to Abu Bakr as siddiq And uh, he went to Abu Bakr and said that, oh Abu Bakr, as you know, Hafsa is a young lady, she has become a widow, and uh, she, I'm looking for a husband for her, so if you are interested, then I would be honored if you be her uh, husband, if you marry her. And Abu Bakr simply turned silent and did not say anything. And Umar understood from this, it's a no. In his shyness, Abu Bakr couldn't say anything. And Umar said, Abu Bakr's rejection was more painful to me than Uthman's. Abu Bakr's rejection was more painful to me than Uthman's. And this irritated him so much that eventually he not complained, but you know, as friends, you talk to your friends, and he's went to the Prophet as a friend to kind of just get it off. You know, as it goes like, you know, you, you, you are frustrated, you want to just express your feelings. And so in a few days, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he explains and he says, Ya Rasulullah, do you know what happened? I went to Uthman, he said no. I went to Abu Bakr, he too, you know, said no. And, you know, um, I find this very difficult. And so at this point, he understood now why what is going on because the Prophet ﷺ said, what if I were to make a better offer? I will give my own daughter to Uthman, it is better for him. And I will take Hafsa for myself and it will be better for her. Okay, so Umar radiallahu anh, of course agreed immediately and then later on when he met Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, Abu Bakr then explained to him that perhaps you felt hurt when I said no and he said yes and so he said that I had heard the Prophet sallallahu mention Hafsa and I did not want to expose the secret of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so I kind of didn't know what to say basically I was stuck. I couldn't say, you know, no, I couldn't say yes, I didn't want to say anything, he didn't know how to respond, so that's why, uh, you know, I, I uh, was acted the way that I did. And this is the story of how uh, Hafsa was married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that is basically, he himself is proposing to the hand of Hafsa directly to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And of course, this story is uh, very beneficial, a lot of morals can be derived from them, and especially in that culture and time frame when uh, women did not go and, you know, uh, hunt for a husband themselves or there was you know a, 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 a likelihood to get married by interacting with others this was a very reserved society especially in those societies the 
fathers have to take charge. And the fathers have to see who is suitable for my daughter. And this is the eagerness of the wali to find the righteous husband and to take an active role in finding the righteous husband. And this is especially in societies where uh, that active role is not taken by the young men and women. Also look at Umar radiallahu and thinking of the most righteous people, Uthman and Abu Bakr, because he wants a person of taqwa and a person of iman. No one will treat a person uh, with the dignity and respect that comes from taqwa that comes from the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also notice here as well that the Prophet sallam, even he is the Prophet he is Rasulullah sallam, still he is asking Abu Bakr and Uthman what do you think of Hafsa for me and this really shows us the importance of mashwara of shura whenever you undertake a big decision you ask somebody and he is Rasulullah sallallahu Still, he's asking Abu Bakr and he's asking Uthman. And he knows because Abu Bakr and Uthman are the closest to Umar. And he knows, they know the ins and outs of Umar and the family of Umar. So he gets the mashwara or the, uh, the advice of Abu Bakr and Uthman radiallahu anh, before proceeding to propose to Umar. And if he is going to take advice before undertaking a task, how about me and you, what we should be doing, as uh, the saying goes, the Islamic saying, that the one who does istikhara and the one who does istishara will never go wrong, okay? The one who does istikhara, we all know istikhara, and the one who does istishara, and istishara means to ask somebody, to get the advice of people. So whenever you want to do something, you ask the people of knowledge, the people of experience, the people who know, whatever field that you're going to go into, get their advice, bounce ideas off of them and then also pray istikhara as well so this incident the the marriage it took place in sha'ban of the third year of the hijra in sha'ban of the third year of the hijra and this shows us the mistake of those who say that the marriage took place after uhud it's very common in many books of seerah and it is perhaps possibly even i myself in my hundred plus episodes i might have slipped accidentally because I looked up and today I discovered that actually there are many books of seerah that make this mistake and many correct this mistake and that is that quite a lot of books say that Hafsa was married after the battle of Uhud and her husband was a shaheed of Uhud no this is a mistake her husband died after Badr and Uhud takes place Shawwal of three year and she was married Sha'ban of three not Shawwal and Sha'ban is before so she was married Sha'ban and Uhud takes place Shawwal. So she is not married after Uhud. It's a very common mistake. And I feel I might have subconsciously said it, but in my excuse and defense, many books of seerah that are just replicating, they say the same thing without making tadqiq, without really looking into it deeply. She was married in Sha'ban and not Shawwal. And uh, her husband uh, did not participate in Uhud. So uh, Hafsa's marriage is from the third year of the Hijra at the age of 21 roughly and she remains obviously uh, his wife till, till obviously he passes away so from the age of 21 up until the age of 27, 28 uh, that is when the Prophet was alive and then he passes away and of course uh, after this she is his wife in this world and the next. So what do we know about her life with the Prophet wasallam? We know a few anecdotes and stories and I'll go over uh, uh, the most of them today and her love for the Prophet is well known and there are many incidents that demonstrate this the famous story of the honey uh, the process of being fed honey and his other wives getting jealous this story has been narrated with two uh, people in it and both of them are in Bukhari it's a big controversy in the classical scholars of hadith who did it happen to in the one version which is the more authentic one it is Zainab who feeds him the honey in the other version, also in Bukhari, it is Hafsa who feeds the honey. Okay, so we have both of these reports. Obviously, one of the narrators made a mistake. And uh, in deep introspection, I will get to that story when we talk about Zainab. It is, inshallah, pretty clear that it was Zainab. However, some authors, when they mention Hafsa, they mention the story of the honey. It's not their fault because this riwa is also found. And this shows us that the hadith collections are not like the Qur'an. The hadith collections, even if they're Bukhari and Muslim, they might have 
hidden defects, very small defects. There's nothing major wrong in Bukhari and Muslim. But what you do have is sometimes these slips. And the authors knew it. So Bukhari has both of these and he knows. Muslim has these both, he knows. And he's showing you, look, I'm just telling you, both of these are there. And in further inspection, we find that in fact, the incorrect one, uh, we can look at through the Isnad what it is. And inshallah, it's pretty clear that it is in fact Zainab that fed the honey and then he was delayed and then what happened happened it wasn't Hafsa as well in our last class when we talked about Aisha radiallahu anha I mentioned uh, Aisha and Hafsa what happened when they were on the journey and both of them got the lots to go on the journey and Hafsa uh, in her own way because she was older than Aisha and she was more mature than Aisha she kind of sort of in a uh, tactical maneuver let's say she situationed herself to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aisha was very irritated because she walked into that and she agreed to it she couldn't blame anybody but herself and I mentioned that story last time and this shows us that she wanted to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also there are a number of hadith we're going to go over some of them today where she's questioning the process of about fiqh about theology so she's an inquisitive lady she's asking him uh, specific things and we benefit from that in our books of fiqh and on our books of, of, of uh, theology as well for example uh, when they were performing hajj uh, she was the one who asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that ya rasulullah why did you tell all of the sahaba to take the ihram off and you didn't take it off why are you still in ihram and the rest of the sahaba are not in ihram and he, then he said that that's because I sent the animals with the hadi and I have them with me and I cannot become yani, muhallil, I cannot remove my ihram until the animals are sacrificed. Basically, from this we learn that there's a type of, of, uh, of hajj which is called qiran and in the qiran hajj, uh, you are not allowed to get out of ihram until the animals are sacrificed. Whereas in tamattu, you get out and the sahaba did tamattu. So we learn from this that issue of hajj that, uh, that uh, the ihram has to be remained in until the nusuk or the hadi is done. Also in uh, Sunan ibn Majah, uh, the Prophet was uh, uh, said to uh, Hafsa that I hope that no one from Badr or from Hudaybiyah will ever enter the fire of hell. And he said this to her. And she replied, but doesn't Allah say in the Quran, wa minkum illa wariduha, every one of you will pass through. And the Prophet ﷺ then said, and didn't you read the next verse? We will then save the people of taqwa and leave the zalimin there. Now, of course, the verse also doesn't refer to Jahannam per se. Warid doesn't mean to enter Jahannam. Warid can also mean to go over or to see. And of course, this verse is about the Sirat, as we're going to be going over uh, the Sirat. And Allah Azza wa Jal then mentions that all of you are going to pass over the Sirat, and then the Muttaqeen will be saved from the Sirat. Another incident narrated in the books of Hadith uh, regarding Hafsa. Uh, and remember, last time I said that the wives of the Prophet were divided into two camps. Contrary to popular perception, Hafsa and Aisha were on the same camp. Okay, so they got along relatively better than the other wives. Now, this doesn't mean that minor disputes didn't happen between them. We already mentioned the story of the traveling. But overall, there were two camps. And Aisha and Hafsa were on one camp. And Zainab and Umm Salama were the leaders of the other camp. So Aisha and Hafsa, like their fathers, were friends. The two daughters were friends as well. Like Abu Bakr and Umar were best friends. So too the daughters were also best friends. Even though sometimes even amongst best friends, trivial things happen. Same thing over here, especially in the case of co-wives. So in this case, there was nothing uh, negative that happened but they were together and they were both fasting outside the days of Ramadan and they had not eaten food for many days and this day they were fasting and it so happened that somebody gifted them some luscious food some luxurious food and the both of them did not have enough patience except to eat the food right then and there and subhanAllah, this really shows how hungry they must have been. That for days they are struggling to eat and then that day they happen to be fasting. Now some delicious food is gifted and the both of them just ate the food. Now this is not Ramadan obviously, it's uh, you know, outside of Ramadan. And the both of them after eating, then they felt guilty. What do we do now? So they're wondering what is to be done, what is to be done. And in the meantime, the Prophet returns and Aisha is narrating the hadith. And she said, Hafsa stood up and rushed to confess what we had done. 
and she was the daughter of her father. This is a phrase of Aisha. وَكَانَتْ إِبْنَةُ أَبِيهَا She was the daughter of her father. What does this mean? Who can tell me? She had the courage and the bluntness. Like Aisha is a bit scared, a bit what not. And Hafsa is the one she just confesses and says, Ya Rasulullah, we were hungry, we hadn't eaten, food came and we broke our fast. Now what do we do? Right? And so the Prophet ﷺ told them to make it up without any other penalty than this. And that is in fact, we learn from this, the fiqh, that when you are fasting a nafil fast, when you are not, uh, something is not the fard upon you, there's no sin to break that fast. But still, you should just make it up any other day. So there's no sin to break a fast outside of Ramadan that is just a nafil fast. This is a nafil fast, right? And nafil fast is much more lax than fard fast. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, there, you know, there's no sin on you, but make it up another day. And this is the, the asal, the default that when we're doing any good deed, even if we have to not do it, then we make it up on another day. But the key phrase here, Aisha is praising Hafsa by saying, and she was the daughter of her father. So we learn some of the characteristics of Hafsa, sometimes which also got her into trouble as we're going to see in some of these incidents. And her ghira for the Prophet Wasallam, it indeed did get her into some trouble, perhaps more than some of the other wives and some of the other mothers. And of them uh, is the incident where uh, she became angry at Safiya uh, binti Huyay, uh, and she then said to her, Yabnata Yahudiya. Okay, so she then said to her, O daughter of a Yahudi. Uh, and so Safiya, Yabnata Yahudi. Uh, and so Safiya then began to cry and she complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Hafsa called me, O daughter of a Yahudi. And you know, uh, the Prophet consoled her and said, How can Hafsa claim to be better than you? For your father was a prophet, and your uncle is a, was a prophet, and your husband is a prophet. How can she claim to be better than you? Your father, meaning Musa, your uncle, meaning Harun, you know, your husband, all of us are prophets. So how can she be better than you? Then when he met Hafsa next, he said to her, Ittaqillah ya Hafsa. Fear Allah, O Hafsa. This was not appropriate what you had done. And so this is some of the, you know, the ghira that happened in Hafsa. So um, one of the... Uh, Definitely one of the more difficult and problematic stories. And again, I gave my disclaimer at the beginning of the seerah of the, well, not the seerah, the beginning of our, the series of the Mothers of the Believers. And I'll give it again now that, you know, these are the stories that typically you do not hear for valid reasons. No problem in not narrating them. But in a class like mine, I think it is always best to be uh, blunt and fair and to give all of the details. And I'd rather you hear it from me than any other source so that you can contextualize. And I keep on saying this over and over again, that sometimes we form an image of the past, of the Sahaba, of even the Prophet that that image is in our mind, it's not in reality. Then when we discover reality, we find a jarring contradiction. And the problem is in our image. The problem is in what we constructed. And that's why it's best to be very academic and frank in this regard. And one of the problematic stories is the story of Hafsa and Maria bint al Qibtiya. Maria, sorry, not Maria bint Shamun the Qibtiya. And Maria, as we know, and we're going to come to Maria uh, uh, when we come to her at the end of the series, we're going to talk about the Milk Yameen of the Prophet. Uh, Maria, of course, was one of the Milk Yameen of the Prophet. And an incident happened because of which Allah Azza wa Jal revealed Surat at tahrim Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu lima tuharrimu ma ahalla Allahu laka tabtaghi mardata azwajik. So this incident, so first and foremost, Surat at tahrim is very clear that something major happened in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And two of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did something they should not have done. إِن تَتُوبَا إِلَى اللَّهِ فَقَدَ صَغَدْ قُلُوبُكُمَا If the both of you repent to Allah, tatuba. So the two wives, there's two wives that have done something they should not have done. And in this surah as well, we learn that the Prophet ﷺ had confided in one wife and told her not to say anything to any other wife. And this wife broke that oath and did confide in the other wife. We also learn, Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, lima tuharrimu ma ahalla Allahu lak. O Prophet, why do you make haram what Allah has made halal in order to please your wife?
So we learned that the Prophet ﷺ had made something haram, that Allah had made halal, and so Allah Azza wa Jal revealed in the Quran, why are you making haram what I have made halal for you? So these are clear facts. What happened? There are two narratives. The one of which is sounds better to our minds, but it doesn't fit the surah as well as this, and that is the story of the honey. The honey story that the Prophet ﷺ ate some honey and then Aisha and Hafsa, they conspired to say the bad smell coming and whatnot. Uh, that is a opinion and it is found in some of the classical books. I'm not saying it's wrong. It is there. Nonetheless, it doesn't appear to be matching the verses fully. There are so the fact that Allah Azza wa is saying, why are you making haram what Allah has made halal in order to please your wives? He did not give up the honey to please his wife. He gave the honey because bad smell is coming from him, or he thought. And other things that just, just don't match up. The strictness of the verse of Tahrim. And the fact that the Prophet is saying, don't tell anybody to one of his wives, what's the honey? It doesn't fit at all. The honey story does not fit the verses at all. To be brutally honest, it is because some medieval people any scholars, whatnot, they wanted to make it look more sanitized, so they take version B and it doesn't fit. Version A, which is Maria al Qibtiya, fits 110%. And it fits the verses, but to the sanitized ear, it is a little bit harsher. So, this is the difference that we have here. And Al Qurtubi clearly says that this story matches perfectly with the verse. Ibn al Jawzi as well, Al Tabari, is the one narrating it in detail and all of this. So, it is very clear, in my humble opinion, and any academic I think will say the same if you really study it with an unbiased uh, mind frame. It's very clear that Surah Al Tahrim was revealed because of Hafsa and Madiya. Not because of the honey story, which is, yeah, and not now. Even Kathir tries to say maybe both of them happened in the same time frame. It's a bit of a stretch. I mean, the verse came down for one issue. Uh, Ibn Kathir says maybe they both happened in the same month or something. Okay, well, maybe they did, but the reason really is the issue of Maria. So, what exactly happened in this incident? of Mari and Hafsa. So the story goes as follows and it is mentioned in a number of books. Al-Tabari mentions in a lot of detail. Ibn Sa'ad has references to it. Al-Tabarani has it. Many books of Hadith, many early books of Tafsir uh, because the Quran is about this. So you will find it in books of Tafsir as well. And piecing it all together, a very clear narrative emerges. And that is that one of the days that was belonging to Hafsa, uh, that the process would, should have been with Hafsa. So Hafsa, excused herself and asked permission to leave the house. So the Prophet is there, she is excusing herself and saying that well, I would like to go visit my parents or whatever. So she has her reason to go and so she is going to be gone for the whole day. And therefore the Hafsa is not there and so the, Pro the Prophet calls Maria. And when Hafsa returns, Maria is in the house. And she understands what has happened. And she becomes extremely agitated and angry, which is completely understandable. She becomes very irritated and frustrated, and she uh, expresses her frustration in very harsh words uh, to the Prophet wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, in my house, on my day, in my bed, Ya Rasulullah, you would not do this to any of your wives. It's only because I have such a low status. So she's very now, she's, she's visibly irritated, understandably irritated, and she is very angry. And the Prophet ﷺ now is calming her down. And in the course of calming her down, he says that, okay, I will not be with Maria ever again. Okay, so to please, to placate Hafsa, he says to, Ma Hafsa, that okay, I'm not gonna go to Maria ever again. Okay, to make you happy, khalas, I'm not gonna go to Maria. So Hafsa says, How can you not go to her when she is halal for you? How can you not go to her? So he gives a qasam by Allah. So now he uses Allah's name, and that's why the Quran is gonna come down. He gives a qasam by Allah that she is haram for me. Now that the qasam has been given. Hafsa is placated. Hafsa is happy. Okay, now she has gotten something in return, and that is that no Maria in the picture. Okay, and the Prophet ﷺ, and this again, this so this whole story from beginning to end, it really shows the human nature of our mothers 
and our Prophet even وسلم, And this is something that we don't typically like to think about And we have our version of the past But in reality He was the best of human beings But he was a human And he was Sayyidu Waladi Adam But he was still Waladi Adam And he was flesh and blood And he ate and he drank and he married And he divorced as we will see so all of this, we, it's not things we like to think about, but these stories, they lay it out in the details that, you know, perhaps beginning students don't want to study, and that's fine, but at this advanced level, it, it's something that we need to do. So Hafsa is placated. She calms down, and the Prophet then commands her that do not tell anyone, especially Aisha. Don't tell her what happened, and don't tell her I gave up Maria as well. Because... The issue comes, there's a dual thing here. Okay, there's a dual thing here. And firstly, the fact that Maria already is causing so much issues and tension with the other wives. It's well known. Okay, uh, and Aisha herself said, when we get to Maria, we'll mention this, that Aisha herself said, so I quoted you two, three weeks ago that Aisha said, I was never as jealous of any wife as Khadija. Well, she has the exact same phrase for Maria as well. Okay, and that's Aisha. She has every right to be. I was never as jealous of any wife as, uh, as any lady as Maria, because Maria is not a wife. Of any uh, lady as Maria, and that was because she was a young, beautiful lady with long hair, etc. So she describes Maria as being somebody that uh, you know the Prophet was enamored with, and Aisha's feeling that uh, this is you know a competition for me. So she did, and the Prophet knew that. If Aisha found out, he'd then have to deal with that as well. There's no need. Okay, I already dealt with one. Now why deal with the other as well? And then the other issue comes that he gave up Maria for Hafsa. And this is going to be a tension between Hafsa and Aisha now. Not a tension, but a competition. Like it's going to be a thing now that, oh, for Maria, sorry, for Hafsa, you gave her up. And when I was irritated, you didn't. So that's another issue. And this is human nature. Again, this is... You know, raw humanity being exposed in front of us, right? We all understand at some level what is going on here. And the, 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 the sensitive nature of relations and the difficulties, frankly, of having polygamous relations and, you know, uh, polygynous situations. And, you know, the brothers like to, I'm not pointing any fingers anywhere, but the brothers <laughs> like to crack jokes about polygamy all the time. The fact of the matter is that even the Prophet it was a headache and a nuisance and an irritation, these types of things. I'm, what am I saying this? Whenever you're in a polygamous situation, whoever has gone through it, our Prophet went through it, and he has to deal with it. And anybody who goes through it. So all jokes aside, it is a huge burden and a huge responsibility. And it brings its baggage that those who know, know. And our Prophet now has to deal with this between the wives as well. And so he tells to Hafsa, that don't go tell Aisha what has happened for all of these reasons. And Aisha, sorry, I'm kidding now. Hafsa promises, I'm not going to. Okay, what happens? Hafsa cannot keep it in. Because this is a point of pride. Look at what I did. Even though they're on the same team, right? But still, it's a matter of I got him to do that. The both of them did not want him to be with Maria, right? But he gave her up for one and not the other. Even though Aisha was also very, and because eventually we'll talk about this, eventually became such a big issue, he had to move Maria to Awali outside of the household. He had to move her to a special house in Al Awali, uh, where you know it was like a, a 45 minutes away. Uh, for for me, he didn't have her anywhere close because the other wives would get so jealous of of Maria, and especially when she became pregnant. Imagine then, right? It was an issue of tension for all of them, and so he moved her all the way there. This is before the pregnancy, obviously. So he promised Hafsa that he's going to give up Maria, and told Hafsa, "Don't tell Aisha." Okay, what happens? She goes and she disobeys the explicit command. And she said she wouldn't do it. And she did it. And she then tells Aisha what happened. And that is when Allah revealed Surah Al-Tahreem to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَإِذْ أَسَرَّ النَّبِيُّ إِلَىٰ بَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِهِ حَدِيثًا When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confided 
with one of his wives about something. Which wife did he confide? Hafsa, right? وَيْتَسَرَّ النَّبِيُّ لَبَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِ حَدِيثًا فَلَمَّا نَبَّأَتْ بِهِ وَأَظْهَرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ عَرَّفَ بَعْضَهُ وَأَعْرَضَ عَنْ بَعْضُ So she basically mentioned it and she mentioned some things that didn't mention other things. She's picking and choosing what to mention to make the story look better for her. فَلَمَّا نَبَّأَهَا بِهِ When he told her, why did you inform? Why did you tell? قَالَتْ مَنْ أَنْبَأَكَ هَذَا She said, who told you that I said? Where did you get this information? Did Aisha tell you that I told her? قَالَ نَبَّأَنِي الْعَلِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ الْعَلِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ told me that you told Aisha. Okay. So, this verse then came down and the Quran basically commanded the Prophet ﷺ to make the kafara for his oath. Right? That this oath should not have been given. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ لِمَ تُحَرِّمُ مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ لَكْ No. You did not have the right to bring Allah's name and make haram what I have made halal for you. تَبْتَغِي مَرْضَاتَ is wajik to please your wives. You shouldn't have done that. I know more what is beneficial and useful for you and what I have made halal for you and you should have not used my name in this regard. And in tatuba إِلَى اللَّهِ The both of you, if you repent to Allah, so then the both is now uh, uh, is being directed to them. Now in this story, what the Prophet ﷺ has done and this again, we have to be very, very frank here. Not only is he Rasulullah Sallallahu so he has a certain concession and laxity that none of us have, but when push comes to shove, did he commit a sin? A'udhu Billah, of course not. Of course not. Maria is halal for him. And Hafsa is not there. She has excused herself. Now, her house, her bedroom, no doubt, it's awkward. And that's why she is irritated. And she has every right to be irritated. But she should have kept her irritation in check. And she did not do that. And she took it more. And the Prophet to, pl to placate her used the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, a'udhu billah, he did not do anything that was haram. A'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. He did not do anything that was sinful. But what he did hurt the feelings of Hafsa. And that is understandable. And Hafsa then reacted in that manner, and then he reacted the way that he did, and then Allah Azza wa revealed the Quran. And this, of course, is the, when you look at the story, it fits Surah Al Tahrim perfectly. And it also fits the next incident that we're going to discuss, and that is the divorce of Hafsa. The fact that Hafsa was divorced, you all know it now because I've mentioned this like a gazillion times, but. The average Muslim is clueless about this, and I think this is a big mistake. The average Muslim still believes, oh, the Prophet never divorced any of his wives. And that is blatantly false. Blatantly false. He divorced multiple, as we will talk about. But the only one that he divorced that he was with was Hafsa. The others that he divorced, it happened before the consummation for reasons we're going to come to. We have a whole lecture about that. But the only wife that he divorced that he was with was Hafsa. He did not divorce any other wife that he was uh, with. Now, the divorce of Hafsa, it's mentioned in the books of Hadith, in the books of Sirah. I mean, it's well known. No scholar denies it. But there is this myth in the minds of the Muslims that the Prophet never divorced. And this myth is dangerous and harmful for one simple reason. It then stigmatizes divorce even more than it needs to be. And you know in our community, divorce is stigmatized. And in our community, divorcees are looked down upon. And this is wrong. Divorce is something that sometimes has to happen. And if it happens, the people should not be stigmatized. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ divorced is enough of an indication that it is a necessary exit when there's no other alternative. There should be no stigma attached to divorce. So here's the other, other point. Hafsa was divorced, unanimous consensus. She was divorced. What is the reason for her divorce? The books of Sirah are silent. Some books of Tafsir mention this is the story of the reason for divorce and that makes complete sense. Why was Hafsa divorced? We have to be clear and say, really Allah knows. But the most obvious reason is this very incident and her direct disobedience to the command of the Prophet ﷺ and the fact that Allah revealed Qur'an about her 
and warning her that if you continue this way, then know that Allah is his ally and Jibreel is his ally and the righteous believers are his allies. And if, you, and if Allah wants, He can substitute wives that are better than you. Muslimatin, mu'minatin, qanitatin, ta'ibatin, ta'ibatin, abadin, sayyihatin, thaybatin, abkara. The whole list is there. So it is as if the Prophet ﷺ understood from the revelation of these verses that Hafsa had been criticized by Allah. This is his interpretation. And so she is no longer worthy to be my wife. So he divorced Hafsa. He divorced Hafsa based on this entire episode and debacle that had happened. And this makes the most sense even though the books of Hadith and Sirah do not explicitly mention any reason. It just, it just says he divorced Hafsa and then he took her back. It doesn't mention why. But if you look at the whole Sirah, there's nothing else that happened that was so big of an issue other than this. And it makes complete sense because we're going to come to it in a while. How and why did he take her back? It makes complete sense if you look at it through this uh, story. And of course, uh, there is an opinion, by the way, there is an opinion that he divorced her twice. But I dismiss that in my humble opinion. It's, it, it, to me, there's no evidence. He divorced her once. They base this on uh, a phrase of Umar, radiallahu an, that, uh, oh, oh, Hafsa, uh, he has already divorced you once. If he divorces you again, then I'll be ruined. Okay, so in this statement, they say that Umar said this before Surah Tahrim was revealed, but in reality, there's no evidence to suggest this, and he might have said this after Surah Tahrim was revealed, which would make sense. So she was only divorced once, not twice. Also, Umar was always conscious of Hafsa's status, and he was always trying to make sure that uh, Hafsa did not get into more trouble, which kind of indicates she had Umar's nature, radiallahu anha. It indicates that Umar knew this, and Umar knew that yani, my daughter might you know, get into this. So there's multiple phrases that we have in the books of Hadith. Um, uh, the most famous one that I have mentioned multiple times, that once Umar was uh, getting angry at his wife, and he raised his voice against her, and lo and behold, she raised her voice back and responded. The audacity of women. Huh? That was a joke, by the way. So, uh, so she responded back. And Umar lost it. And he said, you dare respond back to me? He was not used to a woman responding back to him. She said, you're going to get angry at me? Your own daughter responds back to the Prophet There, what you're going to do now? Umar could not believe this. He forgot the argument with his wife and he rushed to Hafsa's house immediately. And he said, is it true that you respond back to the Prophet ﷺ and you raise your voice at him? And uh, his wife gave a lot of detail. So then she said, and you sometimes don't speak to him for the whole day? She said, yes, all of us do. So then Umar became so angry at Hafsa. And he said, in the long hadith is there, the phrase that is, is there is that, don't be deluded by the fact that your companion gets away with this. She is more beloved and more beautiful than you in his eyes. Don't be deluded by la yughurrannaki. Don't be confused or consider that she's doing it, so don't think you can do it. No, do not ask him anything more. If you need anything, come to me. Don't trouble him. Don't. So she, he is now concerned that my daughter is going to get into trouble by whatever you know things that might be happening and whatnot. So this demonstrates that Hafsa is indeed the daughter of her father, and Umar radiallahu anhu understands this. So back to our uh, story here, uh, and that is that. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, divorced Hafsa. Now it, it's mentioned in the books of Hadith and Sirah that her uncles came, Uthman ibn Mad'un and Qudam ibn Mad'un. They came, these are, these are her kha, akhwal, right? Her mother's brothers, right? So these are her mahrams. They came to visit, finding out what happened. Why did the divorce take place? And there's a very, very important phrase which really proves again that the divorce took place because of what I just said. And that is, she said, the Prophet sallallahu it's a double negative, so to pay attention, didn't divorce me because he doesn't want me anymore. It's a double negative, okay? 
He didn't divorce me because there's no feelings. That's not why he divorced me. In other words, what she's insinuating is the feelings are still there, but something happened that he feels I need to be divorced for. An incident has occurred. Okay? And so it's very clear, therefore, that the incident is what we have just said. That the Qur'an came down and the Prophet interpreted this to be basically asking for uh, divorce. And the news of the divorce spread throughout Medina. Uh, Anas narrates that uh, the city grieved when they heard of the divorce. And he, subhanAllah, you know when you hear somebody, anybody, goes through a divorce, you feel sadness. Imagine it is your mother, it is the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine. So the city was in grief, that they were shocked and they were sad at the divorce of the Prophet, of the Prophet ﷺ and of Hafsa. And of course, the person who took it the hardest was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. It is said that he stayed in house for a few days. Uh, in one report, he put sand on his head and just you know put himself with sand and he said Yabn al Khattab Allah will not care about you after this like I'm gone now after this right so he took it really personally as well that khalas I am ruined now my daughter has been you know divorced and yeah and everybody knew the reason and this is subhanAllah in my humble opinion is my ijtihad completely I could be wrong. Perhaps the reason why the sabab is not mentioned for the divorce is people don't want to mention too many details. They want to gloss over it. Back then, everybody knew. By the time three, four generations come, we don't know. And it's really perfection of their adab that they don't mention these details. So everybody knew. The, the riwayah says, the Prophet divorced Hafsa and then he took her back. That's all the riwayah says. No sahabi said why and what and no. It's a very painful time. And you know, as I've said many times, you know, when couples fight, when parents fight, you know, children don't remember the details, neither should they. And if they do, they don't tell them to the next generation. You don't mention certain things, you just leave it in khalas forgotten. So this is one of those things that the the you know, these internal issues, they weren't passed down to the next generation. And so we have to try to reconstruct whatever we can while we maintain our adab. And so it appears, as I said, that this was clearly the reason. So uh, Hafsa was in her idda. For how long? We have no idea. Could be one week, it could be two and a half months. We have no idea. I went over dozens of books, not a single book gives how long she was in that idda. But all that it says, before the idda finished. So whether it's one month or two months or two months and three weeks, because basically that's when the idda is going to finish, right? Three months is when the idda finishes, right? In this time frame, the Prophet ﷺ came back to Hafsa and said, Oh Hafsa, Jibreel came to me and commanded me to take you back and told me that you are sawamatun qawamatun. You are someone who fasts regularly and prays for a long period of time and inform me that you shall be my wife in this world and in the next world. So the fact that Jibreel came back and told the Prophet ﷺ to take Hafsa to me indicates that the divorce happened because of something Jibreel brought, which is Surah Tahrim. Now, Jibreel did not command the talaq, obviously. But the Prophet ﷺ inferred from it that I think I should divorce Hafsa. And that's why Hafsa said, he didn't divorce me because we don't have any feelings anymore. So it appears, therefore, that the Prophet ﷺ obviously still loved Hafsa. He still wanted Hafsa, but he felt that the Qur'an is indirectly telling him. And that's why Jibreel has to come and say, no, Allah is not telling you to divorce Hafsa. In fact, Allah is telling you to now take her back. She is a good lady and she will be your companion in this world and in the next. And this also shows us as well that the virtues of praying forgives a lot of things. SubhanAllah, Hafsa made a mistake. There's no question about that. But what forgave her mistake? إِنَّهَا صَوَّامَةٌ قَوَّامَةٌ she is somebody who fasts and who prays regularly. So never ever trivialize the salah, never ever trivialize good deeds, continual salah, continual good deeds. She disobeyed a direct command from her husband who happens to be the Prophet That's not a trivial matter. 
and it caused more tension in the household. That's not a trivial matter. But she was forgiven because in the house sawamatun qawwama. And this is one more incentive. If we didn't need any more incentives, one more incentive to make sure that we pray and never make our salah, qada, and also our good deeds as well. And uh, this also shows us, as we said, that uh, Hafsa coming, sorry, Jibreel coming back to me is very clear, therefore, that the, the reason for divorce is Jibreel coming in the first place, which is Surah at tahrim uh, so uh, this is the story of Hafsa and Maria, and after this the Prophet took her back, and of course then they remained uh, married. Uh, Abu Dawud also reports, the Sunnah Abu Dawud reports that once the Prophet ﷺ entered upon Hafsa, and he found with her a Shifa binti Abdullah, who was from her tribe and a distant relative. And a Shifa, by the way, she is a uh, Sahabiya. Again, I wish we knew more about her, but she's a very interesting story. Uh, she was a teacher amongst the Sahabiyat, and she would teach the Sahabiyat how to read and write. You've all heard of the story that Umar appointed a lady to monitor the suqs, right? right? That story is in all likelihood not true, but the name that is mentioned is Shifa, is that lady here, okay? Uh, the story is uh, not really, a, it's reported in a very later book and there's no isnad and whatnot. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, you've all heard it because we obviously have to have equal rights and everything. So we mentioned the story of Shifa. But uh, Shifa was the one who would be the teacher for the ladies. What would she teach them? Reading and writing. She would teach them how to read and write. And the Prophet uh, commanded uh, Shifa to teach Aisha and others how to read and write. And Hafsa had also learned how to read and write from Shifa. So she was a muallima, and she would teach the ladies how to read and uh, write. And she would also heal and perform ruqya, and she would cure. So she was basically any, you know, uh, uh, a lady who was very active amongst the ladies of the community. And uh, once the Prophet came and found Shifa with Hafsa, and so this happened after the incident of, uh, of uh, Tahrim and whatnot. And so he joked with Hafsa, a very, uh, it's a joke that when you have to explain the joke, it ceases being a joke. So this is one of those that you have to explain it in so much detail that it's not funny at all. But it is funny if you understood the context. It's a very, uh, it's only a joke that a couple can do to each other where you put the other one down, but in reality you're teasing. That's the type of joke that's happening, right? So he comes in and he sees Shifa. Shifa is the muallima, the teacher. She teaches writing and she teaches ruqya. Okay? Now, and again to explain this joke, it destroys all the humor in it. But hopefully go back home and think about it at night. And then maybe inshallah you get a smile, okay? Uh, he sees this teacher and he sees Hafsa. And the teacher has taught Hafsa how to read and write. The teacher is also known to teach ruqya. Okay, so I set up the joke, part A, part B. Now there's one other thing I need to do before I set the joke up for you. And that is, there was something that was called the ruqya of the ant. The ruqya of the ant. The ruqya, first of all, what is ruqya? Do you all know what ruqya is? Ruqya is to recite dua and Quran and something to cure, right? And there are people that are raqis. They are, they are people who are known to heal. And they, uh, the ruqya is more effective than the ruqya of other people. This is in our times even to this day. There are people who are raqis. Shifa was a raqiya. She was known for this. Okay. Now there's something called the ruqya of the ant. Ruqya tun namla. What is the ruqya of the ant? The ruqya of the ant is not a ruqya at all. It is a advice that would be given to the bride before she got married. So before the lady got married, the women would teach her the facts of life, you get the point, and other things of this nature. And they would teach her something uh, that because they whispered it, pss, 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 they called it the ruqya of the ant. Okay? So this isn't ruqya like ruqya, but they called it ruqya. And of that ruqya, is that, and it rhymes beautifully in Arabic, but of course in English it's completely destroyed. It's a powerful rap type of thing, you know, it's like the rhythm that they have over there. So the bride should get ready, the bride should put on henna, the bride should put on kuhul, the bride should do everything with eagerness, you get the point over there, except she should never disobey her man. Okay, so this is one of the phrases of the ruqya of the ant, ruqya al-naml. Now with this detailed setup, now you see where this is heading. 
Now you understand the joke, okay? And again, it's one of those detailed things. If you don't understand each and every item, you know, even the average Arab when he reads it can go over his head. What is this thing? He wouldn't understand it. So the Prophet sees Shifa and he smiles and he says, O oh Shifa, like you taught her how to read and write, why don't you teach her the Ruqya of the Namla as well? In the context of what happened, what is he saying? She's not a bride. She doesn't need the Ruqya to Namla. But what happened? She disobeyed, right? So he is basically teasing Hafsa that, you know, if, you, if she had only followed your advice or the advice of the Ruqyatul Namla, then she wouldn't be in the situation we are in here. So it's a very detailed joke to be set up. But anyway, I hope that I set it up for you, inshallah ta'ala. The point is that Hafsa, oh Hafsa, you should teach my wife to obey her husband and we wouldn't have had all of these issues. So uh, Hafsa radiallahu anha, she, uh, a, a number of other hadith are mentioned, we'll mention them here, but there's nothing major that happened after this. And uh, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she stayed in her house. And during the wars of the fitna, Aisha tried to convince her to come with her. And she was close to coming because Aisha and her were very good friends. But it was her brother, Abdullah ibn Umar, who intervened. And her brother strongly suggested slash commanded that she stay at home. And so she did not participate in the wars. And she thanked Allah for that. And one of the biggest blessings that Hafsa was given after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, and for it she shall forever go down in history, was that she was entrusted with the first Mus'haf ever written. This is one of the biggest blessings of Hafsa, that when Abu Bakr radiallahu an compiled the first Mus'haf ever, as you know, he was the one who compiled it, so he was the one who had it in his house. When he died, Umar took it to his house. And uh, when Umar was stabbed and about to die, so he didn't know who would be the next Khalifa, so he entrusted that Mus'haf to Hafsa. And so it went to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu And for whatever reason, Uthman and others did not ask for it to be moved to their house. And they kept it in the amana of Hafsa. So much so that one Uthman wanted to make extra copies. And he brought uh, the scribes to write the Quran all over again to, from the copy of Abu Bakr. He requested a loan from Hafsa. And he told her, I will give it back to you. So in the time of Uthman, the, the Mus'haf was brought to the masjid and it was, you know, six or seven copies were made and then it was sent back to the house of Hafsa and it was in the house of Hafsa until the death of Hafsa. And this is the biggest, one of the biggest blessings that she had after the death of the Prophet wasallam. that she was the one who was entrusted with the care and protection of the first Quran ever written. And perhaps one of the reasons could be as well that uh, she was uh, learned and educated, she could read and write, unlike many of the other women of the time. And Allah knows best why uh, her, Umar never, sorry, Uthman never asked it back permanently, and it remained in the house of Hafsa until after her death, when Marwan the, was the governor, and then he basically, for his own reasons, he decided to get rid of that copy, and that's another story altogether. But this happened after the death of Hafsa, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Hafsa died in the year 45 after the Hijrah, during the reign of Muawiyah at the age of 60. And Marwan ibn al-Hakam, who was the governor of Medina, he's eventually going to become the Khalifa. He is the one who led the Janazah. Abu Huraira was the one who was at the front of the janazah walking to Baqi' and Abdullah ibn Umar, her brother, was the one who entered the grave along with his siblings and children, the family of Umar, and they were the ones who buried Hafsa in Baqi' where she is to this day. And Hafsa radiallahu anha, she narrated around 60 a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Three of them are muttafaq alayh, six of them are only in Sahih Muslim, and the rest of them are found in the various books. And so as I will typically do when the number of a hadith are small, with Aisha I couldn't do anything. I have five volumes. What is the point like what am I even starting it's one of the most right so I didn't even do one because how do you even choose but with Hafsa at least we can do some so this is volume 44 of the Muslim Imam Ahmed why 44 because the women are at the end all of the women appear at the end 
right? So after the men are done, then the last few volumes is the women. And so volume 44 is where Hafsa radiallahu anha uh, comes. Uh, there are 45 actual volumes of hadith and like five volumes of indices, indexes, right? So it's 50 volumes in total, five of which are indexes, 45 of actual hadith. So the second to last is where Hafsa radiallahu anha occurs. And we don't have time to go over all 60, don't worry, but I'm gonna choose maybe 10 or so just to get an idea. Um, no, this is Imam Ahmed's Musnad. I always do Imam Ahmed's Musnad because it has the arrangement according to the Sahabi. So it's easier for us to do, all of the Sahaba. That's why it's called a Musnad. I said this multiple times. Musnad means it's arranged according to the Isnad of the Sahabi. Bukhari is arranged according to topic. These are not topical. These are all the Hadith of Hafsa in one uh, chapter. So most of Hafsa's Hadith are narrated from Abdullah ibn Umar as well. But there are others of the Tabi'un who studied from Hafsa behind a curtain. So this Hadith from Ibn Umar that Hafsa narrated to me that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would always pray two raka'at after the Adhan had been called a Fajr and he would make these two raka'at quick, two short raka'at. So these are the two sunnas of Fajr. Hafsa would see them and narrated that every single day he would pray two raka'at uh, after the adhan and make it very short before and, and before going to the masjid he would pray at his house and then go to the uh, masjid uh, just FYI for those of you that pray fajr that's you also see me when I come in some of you ask why don't I pray tahiyyad I'm following this sunnah so I come in and I lead the salah because the process would pray in his house and then he would come I pray the two sunnahs some of you are wondering I don't pray in front of here because this is for the one who's leading for the one who's not then obviously you have to wait for the uh, for the um, salah over here so uh, Hafsa radiallahu anha narrated that I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Ya Rasulullah why did the rest of the people make ihlal yani go out of ihram and you did not make ihlal after your umrah so he said i was the one who put the uh, qilada on my hadi meaning i'm the one who wrapped the the basically i consecrated my animals and i put the oil of my, on my hair before the ihram which is what they would do when they were going into ihram so i will not exit ihram until the hajj is over meaning until all of the rites are over i already mentioned this issue as well. Uh, Ibn Umar narrated that one day I saw Ibn al-Sayyad. Ibn al-Sayyad was somebody we mentioned him when we talked about Dajjal. There was a fear that he might be Dajjal. I saw Ibn al-Sayyad in one of the alleyways of Medina and I began to basically speak to him harshly and I blocked his way until finally some uh, some fighting broke out between the two of us and I broke his staff and uh, he got angry at me. Then I was told Hafsa what happened. Hafsa said to me, what is your problem with him? Why are you making him angry? Don't you know what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said? That the Dajjal will only come out after somebody makes him angry. That the Dajjal will come out when somebody angers and irritates him. Meaning, why are you messing with this person? If he's the Dajjal, you might expedite it. Why are you always yani, you know, interested in this person? Let him be. So Hafsa radiallahu anha teaches us that something's going to happen to the Dajjal and the Dajjal based on some altercation, based on some anger that's going to happen, that's when the Dajjal will become the Dajjal. That's when he will appear from the uh, Dajjal. Uh, Hafsa narrated uh, that I never saw the Prophet Sallallahu pray sitting down during the Hajjud except for the year or two before he passed away. And during that time, he would pray sitting down. And he would recite the surah in a very slow manner until it was the longest that I had ever seen. So we learn from this that generally speaking, the Prophet Sallallahu prayed to Hajjud standing up. But in the end of his life, when he became old and standing becomes difficult, then he would pray to Hajjud sitting down. And when he prayed sitting down, he made up for it by making it longer than when he would when he was standing up. Okay, So this is a very interesting personal anecdote from Hafsa's eyes, what she has seen. Who else is going to tell us this? At the year before he died, this uh, happened. Hafsa narrated, that I heard the Prophet ﷺ say 
that an army is going to aim for this house, the Kaaba, in a ghazwa, until when they reach Bayda. Bayda is the valley outside of Mecca. You still, when you're coming from one area, I want to say it's the northwest when you're coming from, you will see the word Bayda over there. So uh, the earth will be opened up and they will be swallowed from their middle. And the first of them will come back to see what has happened and they too will be swallowed. And no one will be saved except a small amount who will then tell the others of what had happened. The whole army will basically disappear. And uh, this is the famous incident that will happen after the Mahdi reaches Mecca. And armies will be sent to fight against the Mahdi. And the Mahdi will not have an army to protect himself against those armies. And so Allah Azza wa Jal will intervene and protect the Mahdi by swallowing up the earth. Sorry, by causing the earth to swallow up the armies that are attacking the Mahdi. And when that happens, this is going to be the sign that this person is the Mahdi. Okay? Now, in 1979, some ultra-fanatic, crazed lunatic, and honestly, he is a lunatic. I know some of the brothers get exaggerated when I say this, but I know his stories, and I know his friends, and I know his students, and I have heard enough from about him. He was a deranged man. A psychotic person he attempted to execute this hadith and he held the Kaaba hostage I went over the story in detail what was his goal this hadith he thought that he was the Mahdi he thought he was the Mahdi and he thought that when the armies are gonna come he only had 150 200 men how did he think he would fight against the armies of the royal family? How did he think so? He thought, Allah will help me and the earth will swallow them up. It didn't happen. You do not play a Hollywood script out of the ahadith. When it happens, it happens. You are not a director. You are not the one who will expedite Allah's qadr. This is lunacy. This is craziness. You don't do this. But the man thought, khalas, it's there. Khalas, I'll be the Mahdi and Allah will protect me. And what happened, happened. And you know, the, the Kaaba was held hostage, as you know, for two weeks. And I went over the story uh, in detail, and it is also online. But this is the hadith that he based it on, and I believe it's going to happen. But when it happens, the person it will happen to will not even know it's him. The Mahdi will not even know he's the Mahdi until this happens. He's a righteous man, he's a good man, and the authorities are going to hate him, despise him, they're going to think he's a troublemaker, he's going to flee for his own protection, and he's going to flee to the Kaaba thinking that the Kaaba is going to, you know, I mean it's just the Kaaba, like the, the Haram, right? He's going to go for there. And the evil rulers are going to send people to kill the Mahdi. Uh, that he's not going to be called the Mahdi at this time. Whatever his name is going to be, Muhammad, they're going to call him. And this will happen, and they won't recognize until it actually uh, happens. Uh, Hafsa narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu said it is not allowed for any lady who believes in Allah and the last day that she observes uh, idda uh, for the dead for more than three days except for her husband for the husband then she remains for four months and ten days this is a famous hadith that uh, for the uh, expressing sorrow and grief uh, it should not be done for more than three days uh, and what this means and I've explained this in, in my other lectures as well what this means is that you know when a loved one dies any loved one for a period of time you interrupt your life understandably you know, you just, you don't go to work, you feel sorrow, you know, you just can't live normally, you're just grief. And Allah has in His mercy allowed for three days, let your life be interrupted if need be. It's not wajib to go for three, but for three days, okay. But on the third day, you have to force yourself, collect yourself. When the three days are up, you can't continue living in this sorrow. You have to get back. You have the living go on living. When, our, when we die, we die. The living have to go on living. You can't just live in sorrow that the person has died. So after the third day, you know, get your act together as the saying goes. The one instance where not only are you allowed, but out of respect, you actually show a type of sorrow. And the meaning here is that 
you will not be celebratory, you're not going to wear fancy clothes, you're not going to do anything that is of a, you know, anything that is not befitting, is the wife for four months and ten days, she observes that period, as we all know of Islamic um, fiqh. Uh, Hafsa narrated that when the Prophet ﷺ went to sleep at night, he would lie on his right side and he would put his palm on his uh, cheek. And he would then say, Rabbi qini athabak yawma tab'athu ibadak three times. And he would always use his right hand for eating and for drinking and for purifying and for wearing his clothes and for giving and for taking. And he would use his left for everything other than this. And he would fast three days of every month. So it's a beautiful hadith of Hafsa. She's mem remembering some things of the Prophet Sallallahu This is the anecdotes that you get from the wives from our mothers that nobody else is going to uh, say. Hafsa narrated that uh, one day the Prophet Sallallahu was in my house and his thobe had gone in between his thighs. So he's wearing like the bottom garment and the thobe had gone in between. So the shin and perhaps more than the shin like maybe the upper knee uh, the lower knee is exposed we don't know exactly and this is the famous story Abu Bakr came in and uh, he was as he was then Umar came in he was as he was Ali came in he was as he was other Sahaba came in he was as he was when Uthman came in he took his thobe and spread it out over his feet and then he spoke to Uthman then all of them left I said O Messenger of Allah Abu Bakr came and Umar came and Ali came and all the other Sahaba came and you were in your state. When I saw Uthman come, you opened up your thobe for him. You spread your thobe for him. So he said, Ala astahi mimman tastahi minhu malaika The famous hadith. So this is Hafsa, is the one who is reporting that uh, famous uh, hadith. Hafsa narrated that Atarid ibn Hajib came uh, with a one of the chieftains of Najd with a thobe made out of silk. And Kisra had gifted him that thobe. So it was a very, very fine garment. The Persian ruler had gifted, Kisra had gifted one of the, uh, the, the chieftain leaders with this very fine garment. So Umar said, O Messenger of Allah, what if I buy it for you? Can I gift you this? I want to buy it for you. But it was made out of silk. So he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, the only people who wear this are those who have no share of the hereafter. So Hafsa is narrating what her father did and saying Umar wanted to gift to the Prophet ﷺ. The final hadith that we'll do, and it is also the final hadith in the Muslim Imam Muhammad. I didn't narrate all of them, I skipped over more than half. Uh, the final hadith that we're going to do, that... Uh, Hafsa was asked about the Prophet ﷺ's recitation. She said, you are not able to do that. She was said, no, but tell us anyway. So she said, he would recite in a very slow manner. Qira'atan tarassalat fiha. He would recite in a slow manner. They said, demonstrate it for us. So she recited. So a woman's voice is not awrah. She recited to the men, obviously behind the curtain. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, then she stopped. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, then she stopped. Malik Yawmuddin, then she stopped. Meaning, and obviously she would have done it in Tilawa, but she's trying to show that he would recite in a slow, tartil voice, not the fast zooming that you guys do. That's why she said, you wouldn't be able to do it. He would recite in a very slow, gentle manner. And she demonstrated this by stopping after every uh, verse. So these are some of the ahadith of Hafsa radiallahu anha. And with this, we come to the conclusion of uh, Hafsa's uh, biography in our series. Any quick questions about Hafsa? Yes, Bismillah. This incident which happened in the house of Hafsa, uh, this is the same incident which the other group Not at all. That's a very advanced question. I don't want to go into the details. To answer your question, no. That version of events is not found in our traditions at all. It is found in 
a trend other than Sunni trend. But is it mainstream for that? Wallahi, that's a question that I'm not qualified to answer. Is it a mainstream narrative? You have to realize early Islam, it's as if there are two versions of history. One in the Sunni books, one in the non-Sunni books. And these two versions, sometimes they match up, but a lot of times they don't match up. So that's what he's asking about a particular thing. And uh, you just have to take a, you know, we are coming from one tradition. I, whether that is mainstream, la adri, I do not know. It is definitely there and is definitely found. Whether it's mainstream, I'm not sure. Okay, here's good. Yes. قَدْ فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ قَدْ فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ تَحِلَّةَ أَيْمَانِكُمْ Allah has made it obligatory on you that you break your qasam. So Allah commanded him to break the qasam. See, when we make a qasam, uh, you are, so this is another common myth, especially for some reason, I think it's in our Desi culture more than the Arab culture. Correct me, O oh, Arab brethren, but most Arabs know that a qasam you can make Tahlil of it, right? It's known in the culture, right? For some reason in our culture, the, the Desi culture, it's as if the qasam is like binding and you can never get out of it. And I don't know why that is the case because fiqh doesn't teach that. Even Hanafi fiqh does not teach that as far as I know. Because the Quran is explicit. Kafarata imanikum idha halaftum. And our Prophet said, whoever makes a halaf with Allah and then he sees another thing better than his halaf. Let him make kafara and then do what is better. So the kafara has to be given, right? Feeding 10 people, clothing 10 people, freeing a slave. It has to be done. And that is the kafara that you do. But you are allowed to break the kafara if there is something better. We, we already gave an example that uh, Aisha radiallahu anha made a, a kafara about her nephew and she then made it up. And others of this nature, like if anybody makes a kafara, our Prophet said, if anybody makes a kafara of qati'at rahim, breaking off ties of kinship, get rid of the kafara. Don't mean, meaning, uh, may not, uh, get rid of the qasam, sorry, get rid of the qasam. So qasam should not be done in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that for sure, you need to break the qasam. If qasam is done in something mubah, mubah, and you see that, you know what, I made a mistake, I shouldn't have made that qasam, then you're allowed to break it. In this case, the qasam was made, in our case, it would be mubah, okay? But in this case, one can say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the Prophet something, so it takes on a different status, okay? In our case, it is mubah. But in the case of the Prophet yani Allah is saying, this is my Yani qadr for you, my gift for you, you have no right to then give it up. So this is Allah telling the process indirectly, okay? Yes, sister in the back, yes. Ibn Abbas says, hadith is in Bukhari. Ibn Abbas said that I waited for an entire year to ask Umar your question. Exact your question. And that is, which are the two that are mentioned in Surah Tahrim? In Tatuba ilallah. Ibn Abbas said, I waited for a whole year to see when I could ask Umar ibn Khattab which were those two. And that opportunity presented itself when we were going for Hajj. And I then took his water to do wudu. He went to do wudu. He came back and I started pouring water for him to do wudu. And there was no one other than the two of us. So I said, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, who were the two ladies that Allah says in the Quran, In tatuba ilallahi faqad saghat qulubukuma? So Umar says, O oh, son, don't you know? It was Hafsa, his own daughter, and Aisha. Hafsa and Aisha. So that hadith is in Bukhari. Okay? So Umar radiallahu anhu was asked your exact question with your exact wording. Who were the two ladies? Your curiosity is the curiosity of Ibn Abbas. MashaAllah. Okay. Yes, I hope it's a question I can answer. <laughs> Why was Aisha asked to repent? 
it appears that there was some conspiring that they were trying to do to get Maria out of the picture. And so this was a success from the both of their teams, even if Hafsa took the credit. But they were attempting multiple times to get Maria out. And Allah Azza wa Jal chastised them that this is not what you should be doing. And by the way, the ending of Surah Al-Tahrim is also very relevant here. What is the ending of Tahrim? ضرب الله مثلا It's the example of the righteous wives and the unrighteous wives. Or the righteous women and the unrighteous women. The end there. So this is like a very stark uh, you know, story for the, uh, for, the, for the whole incident as well. Uh, كَانَتَا تَحْتَ عَبْدٍ مِنْ عِبَادِ الصَّالِحِينِ فَخَانَتَاهُمَا This is a key point here, right? That they betrayed the trust of their husbands. فَلَمْ يُغْنِيَ عَنْهُمْ مِنْ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَقِيلَ دَخُلَ النَّارَ مَعَ الدَّاخِلِينَ Okay, this is the wife of? Nuh and the wife of? Lut. So, Allah is giving the example. What was the khiyana that they did? They disobeyed their husbands. The khiyana is not, a'udhu billah, nothing like that. That never happens with the wives of any prophet. The khiyana is they disobeyed the trust of their husband when it comes to the risala, not when it comes to the conjugal relationship. So Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, "Darab Allahu Mathala," and then "Darab Allahu Mathala Ladina Amanu." Imra'at Fir'aun, it's called "Rabbi Bnidi Ainda Gabeitin Fil Jannah." Ida Akhir Al Ayah, Insha'Allah.